Hello everyone and welcome to another video from Carl's Tech Shed. Well as I promised on Facebook a few days ago, um, I've got this magic messenger device here which I'm going to do a teardown of. Uh, this is a premium rate text messaging device which was released in uh, 2004. Um, it allows you to send text messages through a standard phone line to mobile phones or other devices like the magic messenger. Um, it's it's quite an in, it's quite an interesting uh, device really because um, a lot of people uh, on Amazon are mainly leaving reviews saying that it's used for um, people who are hearing impaired or deaf or find it difficult to communicate. So they set one of these up and they can communicate with other people who have one of these devices or have a mobile phone. So on that on that front, it's quite interesting. The only downside is that this is a premium rate service, which means that instead of sending the message directly to the recipient, it has to go via a premium rate phone number, which I think charges you about 60 pence a message, which is absolutely ridiculous in this day and age uh, for, for the cost of a text message, um, especially if you get a conversation going, just, you know, 10 messages each way and you're looking at 12 pounds total. Um, uh, which is it's incredibly expensive nowadays it's very uneconomical so uh, that's why I picked this up so cheaply and I thought I'd it'd make an interesting teardown um, it runs on three AA batteries and it just plugs into a standard phone line via the uh, RJ11 connector on the back uh, the batteries go in the bottom um, it's made by a company called Comtech Holdings Limited. Uh, I looked them up on Google, but I can't really find anything about them nowadays. Uh, bear in mind, this is 10 years old, which is a lifetime in uh, in tech terms. Um, it's just held together by a few of these self-tapping uh, crosshead screws. Um, very plasticky design, very plasticky feel about it. There's a rubber membrane keypad. Um, the actual menu is not too bad to use, I suppose. Um, it's quite Quite simple you've got a few buttons at the top you've got compose inbox escape okay clear a few of these keys here there's a lot of random um, unusual characters from various uh, Nordic languages and such which are above these keys which which tells me that this was probably um, sold into the European market as well as the UK market the only thing I find interesting is that there's no um, safety um, there's no there's no safety markings on this or certification for use with telephone lines. So it makes me wonder whether they actually bother to get any of the certification, um, which which you have to do to ensure that it's it's not only safe but it's it's not going to damage the telephone network. Because uh, legally speaking, uh, unless it's got those certificates, you wouldn't be able to plug this into a phone line in the UK. How, how, whether that would be enforced or not is another matter, but still, it, it would be nice to see some sort of uh, certification on the back of this. Well, I'm going to open this up now, and uh, we'll see what's inside it. Right, well, now that I've opened this up, you can see that we've got two separate types of board here. Um, we've got the old Fenelix style board on the uh, on the bottom here, which is just um, for the keyboard membrane and for the battery terminal. And then we've got the standard FR4 style board up here, which is uh, w which contains all of the all of the uh, components. Now, I'd be uh, I'm going to take this off in a moment, but uh, I'd be very surprised if there's any components on here whatsoever. Um, if there are any components, there's going to be no more than maybe a couple of passives, maybe a couple of resistors, a capacitor, and certainly no more than that. Um, as you can see here, we've got two um, die on PCB uh, integrated circuits here. Again, these are the cheapest way of producing an integrated circuit on board, um, especially in mass production. Basically, you take the um, silicon die, you pop it onto the PCB, you then wire bond it, and then you drop a, a blob of this. Uh, it's like a ceramic resin over the top, which it, it looks um, quite soft in the video, but it's incredibly tough. It's uh, hard. It's very hard, and uh, when I've tried to take these off before, um, it, it either cracks the um, the silicon die or it takes the silicon die off as well. So it's completely impossible without chemicals to remove that uh, to expose the uh, silicon. 
Now we've got another an, another IC over here, as I mentioned. At first, I thought this was maybe a memory IC or firmware or something like that. But when you look at the tracks, there's there's nowhere near enough tracks, and they don't go into the right place. Um, you'd you'd see I maybe even eight or sixteen tracks going directly into this chip here if it were memory, um, but it's not. So I'm guessing this is probably going to be like a modem controller or something like that, because I I, I doubt that they've got the modem controller built into this because because it would be too uh, specific to have a controller like this with a built-in modem because you have to remember this this type of die would probably be put into hundreds of different types of uh, device uh, not just uh, a text messaging device with a modem but they could go into calculators um, uh, personal organizers just very cheap stuff like that um, the type of architecture this process is going to be running on is probably going to be 6502, 8502, or Z80, some, something similar to that. It's, it's not going to be anything incredibly powerful because all it's got to do is display a message on the screen and uh, send, some, uh, send some data over to the modem. So it's going to be a very low-powered IC. Um, but unfortunately, without um, without actually looking, um, without actually taking the ceramic resin off it's impossible to tell because there's no markings on this because this is just a blob of resin and uh, there's no information available out about this online and obviously because of the limited interface it's impossible to uh, tell through the software um, or through the user interface what type of processor it is. Now I mentioned um, that there were no uh, certification marks on the outside of the plastic um, for use of a phone line and I think I realised why. Um, personally I think this would, uh, I mean I can't be certain but I've got a pretty good feeling that um, if you'd put this up to any sort of um, test for um, certification for use of a phone line it would fail immediately. Um, the main reason is that the, um, the phone line circuit here um, isn't segregated enough um, from the rest of the board for it to be considered um, for it to be considered safe enough um, to use with a phone line I mean arguably speaking there's probably nothing wrong with it I mean you're probably never going to have a problem with this but uh, in order for it to pass for certification you have to meet certain standards um, I don't I don't know them all off the top of my head but I know for certain that this little bit down here um, you can see that there's very very little creepage distance between um, the high voltage capacitor here which is going directly over the phone line and uh, a small there's a small pad there which although it's unpopulated it goes straight down into the main IC, so um, there's probably only about a one, one and a half mil gap between those two, which isn't far enough apart um, for, for the type of voltage that this is going to be handling. Bearing in mind that a phone line in most countries varies between sort of, uh, 40 and 80 volts. I think here in the UK it's 48 or 50 volts AC, so um, that's something you really need to watch out for um, when you're looking at stuff like this, because uh, there's so many points here that this could fail. Um, it could arc over, it could, um, you could get a spark, which would jump between the high voltage and low voltage it wouldn't just kill the it wouldn't just kill the equipment um, but it could also be quite unsafe um, it could even start a small fire in worst case scenario um, if the batteries uh, if, if the batteries were in poor condition as well so um, it's it's all worst case scenario stuff but um, it's 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 something you still need to think about when when designing this sort of thing, and um, it's certainly certainly not been done to a high high standard. Um, it looks like it's just been made to 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 be manufactured for the absolute lowest price possible. There's probably you know next to nothing you could shave off of this and it would still work. Um, they've literally cut this right to the bone to get the um, to get the maximum efficiency out of the production on this. As you can see, all the capacitors, these are all, um, these are all no-name brands. Um, the transistors, they're all no-name brands. Same with the diodes, same with, same with everything on here, really. It's just really low quality. I mean, it works, and it'll probably work for years, but the actual build quality of it 
is incredibly poor. I mean, there's also an unpopulated, um, there's an unpopulated socket there. So that it, you can see it's a, a through hole because there's four holes there. Um, so it's probably like a loop through um, in the design where you could plug in um, the phone line into here and then a telephone directly into here, um, which which would make uh, would make a lot of sense because if you want a phone connected to this to the same line as well. Um, you could just plug this in directly and then plug the phone into here via a, a small RJ11 adapter. But um, no, instead they've left that out, um, probably to save a few pence for a, the cost of another connector and maybe a few passive components which they've left off here. So they've dramatically reduced the, um, the features on this by doing so, and they've probably only saved less than 30 or 40 pence by doing that. Um, but this means you'd have to have a separate phone line to go out from here into your phone socket and then have a separate uh, cable for your telephone so uh, again efficiency hasn't really been thought about you know in terms of consumer it's all about uh, the bottom line it's all about cutting the costs as much as possible uh, while still being able to advertise the product as uh, as the device that it, that, it, that it is you know that you can still just about use it uh, another interesting part here is that the battery terminals are directly onto the board. Um, so instead of having a separate battery compartment built into the plastic and then having a couple of cables onto here, um, you've just got two springs on here. So this is obviously the positive end, this is the negative end, so you've got four and a half volts across here. Um, there's probably a little bit of power management here, you know, just for just for, to reduce the voltage, maybe down from four and a half to three point three volts for the uh, for the processor. But um, there's nothing serious at all. It probably doesn't even have a low battery alert. Um, when you get a low battery, it'll probably just shut off altogether. I'm going to take these apart. I'm just going to take these boards out now and see if there's anything underneath them at all. Uh, again, I'll be very surprised if there's anything under here. Um, someone's crudely marked this in pencil with a tick in the factory, so I'm not sure what that's all about. Probably just to say that he's he's looked at it and that's about it really, because there's not really uh, can't really see any other you know safety concerns or um, quality control or anything on that at all so um, I'm just going to take this out and we'll see what's underneath it. Right well now that I've taken this board out as I presumed um, there's there's absolutely no components on this whatsoever um, there's plenty of these small pads which connect into this uh, which, which just go underneath this keyboard membrane um, just to make contact. Um, very similar to what you find in pocket calculators and stuff like that. Um, certainly the cheapest possible way of making a keyboard. Um, and you can see that it's got some sort of custom design to it in the way that they've, uh, you know, there's some non-standard keys on here. Um, they're in an unusual position. So this has obviously been custom made just for this specific device. Um, we've got a date code down here of the 36th week of 2004. Um, but yeah, apart from that, there's absolutely nothing else on here. Um, just a cup, as I said, these two horrible um, interconnect wires which are conveniently um, held in with glue here. Um, I was just thinking while I was taking a taking the board out I was probably I was probably a bit lenient when I said that it was that they'd probably save 30 or 40 pence um, not adding that socket um, to be honest in my head I was just thinking how much that component would cost me if I were to buy it but obviously I'd only be buying one of them um, this company if they're buying thousands upon thousands of these RJ11 sockets they're probably getting them for pennies so they are probably save probably less than five pence by by not adding that in so it's absolute you know penny pinching by removing such uh such an in, uh, you know an, an interesting feature um which would certainly make this device a lot more user friendly and they've done it purely to save just a few pence nothing there's no other reason for for not fitting that um if i flip this over now um there's a couple of these leds here now when you've got the front on this all these these just indicate whether you've got a message and apparently it indicates whether you've got a low battery um, I know I said that uh, I wasn't sure if it had a low battery indication circuit but um, the low battery indicator it's probably just a timer or something like that I'm really not sure um, but I really doubt they put any real thought into that um, you know because if they've if they've missed off such an important feature of, as, as a second socket for a loop through um, I really don't think they're going to spend a lot of money developing uh, or designing um, a low battery circuit for this. It just really wouldn't be worth their time. 
Um, but as I, as I was saying about safety here, um, we've got a couple of these LEDs here. Uh, if you look how these are designed, um, you've got a through hole LED here. It's then bent at a 90 degree angle uh, and then goes directly up. But right next to this, uh, about two mils away from this, is the 50 volt phone line connection. Um, so it's it's incredibly close, quite dangerous as well. Because uh, if that were to if that were to connect up to that, and let's just say, again, let's just assume the worst case scenario, there's a power surge um, and you get you know lightning strike uh, on the phone line and you get you know sort of a couple of million volts, at a few uh, a tiny amounts of ampage even. Or, then you know you know you're looking at a catastrophic failure for this. The whole unit would probably uh, you know could even cause a fire. I'm not really sure, but it certainly wouldn't wouldn't be as safe as if you'd um, properly designed this uh, this device. Um, I mean, but even even in in a best case scenario, if you've got 50 volts going through this, it's not going to do the LED any good, and it could even heat up to the point where it melts something. Um, again, it's it's just not very safe at all. It's really not something I want to think about um, because the design of this is it's it's very poor, um, and and for no for no apparent reason, there's no reason for making making this um, as such poor quality. You know, it would. If they'd have just spent a little tiny bit more money, you know, even just a few pence on each unit extra, um, they could have a much safer and much more reliable unit, um, which is going to pass all of the uh, safety tests required to get this properly onto the market. But instead, this has gone into this device has probably ended up in, uh, you know, in America in probably places like the dollar store or places like that. I'm not really sure. I've never seen one myself before now. Um, but yeah, just overall, it's just not a very nice design. Um, I mean, even for this, uh, even for the LCD backlight, I've just got one of these small light pipes uh, and a single LED at one end. So um, I must admit, when I was when I powered it on and I I used the LED, I could see that this side of the LCD was a lot brighter than the other end because there's no LED on the other end. Um, I mean, what does an LED cost? You know, probably just a couple of pence when you're buying them in, in the thousands. But yeah, I mean, overall, it's just not not a very nice not a very nice design inside. I mean, user user friendliness. You know, if you actually want to use the unit um, for its intended purpose, it's probably not too bad. But just opening it up for this, from a design point of view, it's just very very poor. Um, you know, it's 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 one of these it's one of these things where you look at it and you realise that they've they've there's probably absolutely nothing more they can save. By manufacturing this, there's nothing else they can take off, remove, or not include just to get the price down a little bit more. So, um, yeah, I mean that's 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 what I think of it personally. And uh, I mean, if you've got any comments on this, if you've got you know similar devices or you've actually used one of these, um, please feel free to use a, use the uh, comment box to leave a comment. And uh, if uh, if you want to see more of this sort of stuff, um, just let me know. Well, um, thanks for watching, and hopefully I'll have another video up soon.